Pain and suffering is caused by living in the ignorance of your own truest nature. This teaching is no longer just a lesson for a prominent educator and follower of Sri Sancha Sai Baba. How strong of an attraction has this become for you? Well, I would say it's, it's uh, become a reality in my life. Longtime Sai Baba devotee Dr. Ronnie Morantz, an internationally known educator, knows a lot about non-duality and self-inquiry. That's where Swami says that 75% of sadhana is self-inquiry. But knowing that, many devotees turn to other paths to move closer to Baba. So if you're all the devotional practices and, and including all, all the service we do, that, that's just tilling the soil for the self-inquiry. Self-inquiry is the key to awakening to that truth. Baba gives this and awaits for others to accept it. And his ultimate message is, of course, I'll give you what you want until you want what I have to give. This wanting what he has to give, that is non-duality. That's the truth. And not everybody really wants that. But increasingly, Sai devotees and others, including Dr. Morantz, are turning in this direction. Have you had that or some semblance of an awakening experience yourself? I had a, an experience in 1979, totally unlike anything I had ever experienced before. A complete state of divine love where there was no separation from anything, that everything was God. It's not like something was attained. It's like things were stripped away. In that moment, Illusion was stripped away. I felt I knew at that mo in that moment everything there was to know. But just before that realization, in Baba's village of Puttaparthi, Rani had felt anger, despair, and she cried. Those tears turned into the anger turned to tears, and then the tears turned to this divine, expansive love. And the reason behind that anger at Sai Baba will be revealed. Welcome to Soul Journeys. This interview with Dr. Ronnie Morantz was recorded on March 12, 2022. Ronnie Morantz, welcome to Soul Journeys. It's a pleasure to have you here. I've seen you on YouTube and in other videos many times, and I'm so, I'm so gratified to have the privilege to sit down and talk with you today. Well, I am so delighted to have been um, invited and uh, to, be, to be doing this. Let's begin, if it's okay, by having you tell us about your spiritual upbringing, that is, assuming you've had one. My um, grandmother was an Orthodox Jew. My father was an atheist, and my mother tried to accommodate both of them. Not an easy task, so there was a a bit of volatility in the house between the three of them over the issue of religion. But what I remember most about the influence of my grandmother <clears throat> as an Orthodox Jew, she used to tell us when we were children, she used to tell us all of these stories, which eventually I learned were not from the Torah, the five books of Moses, they were from the Midrash, which are the more mystical explanations of, uh, of those stories and their significance. And of course, I didn't know that as a child, but I'm sure that that either it influenced me or I was just very open to that. We're going to get to uh, the wonderful stories that you have to share with us today. And I know there are plenty about the life of Sri Satya Sai Baba and how he uh, came into your life. Even the most important lessons Baba's taught you because i've heard you reference these things and that is pursuing the answer to the all-important question of who am i the practice of self-inquiry the pain and suffering that's caused as you say by living in the ignorance of your own truest nature how strong of an attraction has this become for you well i would say it's it's uh, become a reality in my life began through well, it begins at childhood. I can remember some experiences that when I was four or five years old, <clears throat> I was standing on an armchair 
Uh, we lived in a small apartment in an apartment building in Brooklyn, New York. I was standing on the armchair and I was looking out the window and it was nighttime. And all I could see was my own reflection. And I asked myself, which one is real, this one or that one? <laughs> So you see that question, I think we're born to some extent with these questions. I, I don't, yeah, I would say that's my, my belief. We're born with the certain questions. We're born with a, a certain destiny to explore um, our truth in different ways at different levels. My experience with, um, with Swami, with Sai Baba, he continually reinforced that message of non-duality. And at the same time, I functioned a great deal in the Sai organization on the level of duality, being very involved in um, Satya Sai education and human values, which is about taking the non-real personality somewhat seriously in that you have to develop character. There's that <clears throat> yin yang there, that as long as we, we have a sense of being in the body, being a body, it needs to deport itself dharmically. And I have to tell you that what you said a minute ago, that Baba's first and foremost message was to teach the lessons of non-duality. I don't see a lot of people picking up on that. Maybe it's because their interests are far greater than doing seva or puja. Do you have that opinion? Yeah. Yes, I do. I, that, is, <clears throat> that has been my experience in that, um, you know, Swami was once asked, what is the purpose of the Sai organization? And his answer was <clears throat> to foster and strengthen devotion. So I think it, it might be fair to say devotees are predominantly devotees. People who follow Swami are predominantly devotees. And that involves all various different practices at different levels of different intensity. And yet his ultimate message is, of course, I'll give you what you want until you want what I have to give. And so this, this wanting what he has to give, that is non-duality, that's the truth. And not everybody really wants that. And that, I think that's where I feel it's intrinsic. I, I honestly feel that you're, you're born with the desire almost to know the truth at that level. I mean, I've had so many conversations with people, friends and um, all sides, the side devotee friends of mine, and even occasionally non-side devotees. Um, and when you talk about non-duality, I'll call it, non you know, you get a lot of head nodding and yes, yes, yes. But in terms of living it, that it becomes a practice and um, it's just not for everybody. Non-duality is not for everybody. I guess not. I mean, you were this very, and are this very significant world teacher, having been a principal in two schools, you're an author, you've, you're, uh, Dr. Morantz is known here and there within and outside, well outside of the Sai Baba world. I was raised this C plus, maybe just a C student, yet I had since childhood a similar quest to know the truth of the image in the glass pane, who am I? I don't know why or where that question came from, but it's it served me well because it only took about 60 years for me to find uh, the path that would possibly yes. lead to the answer. Yeah, I mean, um... You know, there's, Swami says, of course, there's three predominant paths and everything in between. But there's, there's bhakti yoga, devotion, the path of devotion. There's karma yoga, the path of service. And there's jnana yoga. And he himself has said there are very few that are going to be on the path of jnana yoga. There has to be a readiness. There has to be an intellectual, psychic, heart. There's a readiness there. And uh, it doesn't happen until that readiness is there. That's what, that's what I believe. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I mean, I, I'll tell you, I'll share this. I have a very dear friend who is a, um, a Western nun 
in the Vedanta Society of America. And she, she took vows with her teacher in California. And um, we have had tremendous conversations uh, very similar to this. And at one point she said to me, you know, Ronnie, I am not as interested in non-duality as you. <laughs> I mean, and it was true. Well, she was raised like I was, a good Catholic, only picturing God outside of self. Yeah, no, I wouldn't even say that was the case. It's just that when it came to, I'm going to say, living it, she wasn't as interested. I don't know exactly what that means. I know I have certain practices. Mm -hmm. In other words, there is, I, I live a, a certain way based on the, on the fact that this is not real. You know, when people talk about, oh, there's not enough time and nine out of 10 times, I'm going to say, but there's no such thing as time or yeah. space. <laughs> you know? And so um, because you're, you're continually remembering yeah. That, which is, it's very easy to get caught up in worldly activities and conversations with friends that are on the level of duality. Yeah, yeah. Family, yeah. friends, work, politics, and all of that. And I engage with people to the, some extent that they are interested in those things. But there's a voice inside of me that is always saying, but that is not real. That is not real. That is not real. So, and she, that was not something for whatever reason. This is where I say there's like a predisposition. She is a scholar in non-duality. <laughs> the Vedanta of uh, Vivekananda. But she doesn't incorporate it as, as much as I was, for whatever reason, in her life. Reminds me of the great quote from Sai Baba. I don't remember how to cite the source of it, but which would you rather have, information or transformation? And there's plenty of information about non-duality. I hope your sister friend continues with the Vedanta Center and continues hopefully listening to Swami Sarva Priyananda because he's an excellent teacher and uh, uh, that could carry her another step forward in her perhaps attainment if maybe it'll happen without her even seeking it. Well, you've touched upon something moving away from her a little bit. You've touched upon the word attainment and then I have to re I'm reminded that there's no such thing as attainment. There's it nothing to attain. <laughs> yes. There's nothing to attain. Yeah. We have to relearn the language, don't we? Because there's so many tripwire words that yeah. you use for the sake of convenience to convey what non-duality is. But there is nothing to seek. There is nothing to find. And as you say, there is zero to attain. So that's another good point that you just, you know, good observation you made about uh, the use of language. And that is something when it comes to uh, the truth with the capital T, the non-duality, uh, the truth of the self, that I'm, I'm, I really pick and choose my words a lot. I mean, it requires a lot of mindfulness, yeah. a yeah. lot of mindfulness, which for me is a way of life. Sure, right. that's, that's what your whole life represents. I mean, uh, teaching what's right, what's correct, and mm -hmm. mindfulness would have to be employed, I'm guessing, all the time. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, when it came to uh, teaching children or being a teacher of teachers aspiring to teach children, especially the human values, um, you have to you have to be mindful all the time. Anyway, I mean, it's a great joy. That's something that you like. Some people become a doctor, and that's what they get joy out of. And some people are are built to be teachers. I was built to be one. I never aspired to be a teacher at all in my, in my early days. And for the most part, most everything that has happened to me has been not of my choosing, nothing I planned, nothing I 
I think at all that I planned or even necessarily desired. They just, life unfolded and circumstances, as the Buddhists say, causes and conditions, causes and conditions in a, arose and there I was a teacher. Causes and conditions arose and there I was a mother, married and a mother. None of these things were anything that I envisioned at any point in my life. One last point about this too, because I think it's worth saying or reminding people, most devotees uh, I know are, are just absolutely head over heels in love with their seva projects, with their repeating the name of the Lord and their puja projects and with devotional scene. But self-inquiry as described by Sai Baba, as described his whole life by uh, Bhagavan Ramana Mar Maharshi, Vivekananda, whom you mentioned there too, this seems to simply get short shrift, and I'm not sure why, especially in light of the many times uh, which I've been told that Baba has earmarked people's studies or sent them to Tiruvannamalai, where Ramana Maharshi's ashram was. Baba would make it perfectly clear that all of these pathways are important and all of these lessons are hugely important, but there's one up here, <laughs> and that is... Uh, learning the truth of who you truly are, and then building your life around that framework. Uh, I don't know if it's ever going to change, do you? The, the people's deafness about not caring to hear that message. I have to go back to my belief that um, we are either previously disposed to the message or the rather the experience of non-duality because non-duality is an experience otherwise it's just an intellectual activity in which it's a, about information information and knowledge um, the potential for transformation is there depending upon how deeply you study these things and question what you're reading which not everybody does either um, so i really think that it's a either the inclination is there or not the Psy organization was set up to foster people's devotion. And that's what it does to this, to this day. And, um, you know, that's, I mean, it's a legitimate path. You know, I am a devotee in, in the sense of, uh, I have a, uh, a Guruji, a figure, an image that I can point to and say that, you know, my, my devotion <clears throat> my devotion in the past was very more centered on the form. In the early days, my devotion was, was focused on the form. Mine too. I experienced this expansive love. Uh, and then gradually that love was projected onto Sai Baba. Yeah. And um, so I lived, I lived the life of a devotee. <laughs> For a long time, I heard the message of non-duality, but un, and I had even experienced that. Ha, ha, but this brings us to one of my favorite topics, which is vasanas, vasanas or samskaras. So these are <clears throat> the clouds that get in the way. These, these are, are tendencies that we are either born with or gain along the way. Absolutely. We are born with these tendencies. Swami himself has said, for example, that any karma we're experiencing in this life is, is you know, comes from a past life. And now I always qualify that there's no past, there's no future, there's only the present anyway. But, but even this dream, this illusion of life, there, there does seem to be past lives and future. Exactly. It's all happening at once, but there seems to be um, that it was in the past. So, so we are born with these inner tendencies and they are not easy to identify. You know, what's, it's often just brushed off as, oh, we have these inner tendencies, inner tendencies. If you ask someone to identify what their specific inner tendencies are, that is very few people can identify them. How and, could they? They, would, they must think they're perfectly normal and natural from the day they were born. Well, that's where, you know, that's where Swami says that 75% of sadhana is self-inquiry. So if you're 
all the devotional practices and, and including all, all the service we do, all the, um, that, that's just tilling the soil for the self-inquiry. Self-inquiry is the key to awakening to that truth. You know, this is me, not we all, as Ramakrishna says, there are as many um, spiritual paths as there are human beings. So I don't expect or wouldn't expect other people to think the way I do, but I have a burning desire for clarity, burning desire to be able to identify the elements that obstruct my sense of self. But you're an educator. Why would you not have a- Well, yes, exactly. It's not for everyone. But you uh, said yourself a minute ago that yeah. Baba said 75% of the path of the work is yeah. the work of self-inquiry. Self-inquiry. It, it, it may be. And at the same time, not everyone knows how to en engage in it to the extent where you can recognize how certain inner patterns, like for example, some very simple things, because I've actually explored this deeply and written about it. You know, I'm not worthy. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've been abandoned. Yeah. Nobody loves me. I know this better than anyone else. You know, a certain sense of uh, conceit. So these are the obstacles because they are they have become part of our identity. Have you written about this in book form that people can obtain and read? I have. No one can obtain it because it hasn't been published yet. <laughs> and I don't know if it will ever be published. I, I've written a book called The Dharma of Education. And um, I sent it out to, I actually had a, an agent. Not, well, I had it was a it was an odd experience in the Sai organization. When I finished the book, mm -hmm. I sent it to the uh, Sri Satya Sai, you know, the book trust sure. in India, and they approved it. And then they said, you know, go ahead and get it published. So I sent it off to the publisher in Bangalore. Within a week, there was an edict from Modi that prohibited any donations from foreigners to things like bookstores. They were no longer allowed because it is a donation. You have it printed. You pay to have it printed. You don't give them money, but you pay to have the book printed and then to then they continually print it for you afterwards as long, not for you, but for as long as there's an interest in it. And so within a week of that permission, I, I got a notice that they would not be able to accept the book. That sounds like Baba throwing a wrench in. Oh, of course, of course. So that's that's some that's at least six years ago. Why don't you self-publish it? No, I ha just have no desire to self-publish. It just doesn't feel right. The one then you have to distribute it or tell people about it. There's a lot of self-promotion then that has to take place, even even innocently, even without any real ego involved. But I guess I don't want to be engaged in that. So, you know, my feeling is, I mean, it was stopped for a reason. One week, one week before that. What if I had been in touch with them a week before that? Yeah, right. Then what if I, you know, well, so. We'll just have to have you on more often so you can uh, talk more broadly about what you wrote in that book. Not so I have a whole chapter on the on vasanas and our inner tendencies and how to identify them. What do they sound like? What do they feel like? Um, and then how to eliminate them. Well, sure. Or at least acknowledge that they're there, muddying up the water of your life. But yes. knowledge is two thirds of the solution, I would think. In, in the talks that you've given that I've seen that are on YouTube, are you aware how, how often you sprinkle in the subject of self-inquiry, who am I, non-duality, yeah. into your talks? I yeah. assume that's by a, on purpose. Very conscious. 
but you just sort of skim the headlines as if, well, I got that one through. Nobody raised any eyes. I'll go on to something else they can relate to. I, I'm, I'm waiting for the day that more people begin to embrace Baba's biggest message and lesson. And I'm glad to see you doing it. Well, it's natural at this point. I can't imagine. See, otherwise you're just engaged in, in, in non-truth. You know, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. It's like, you know, there's the story of, I don't know, it was one of the great Buddhist teachers, Marpa. He had all the teachings, years of teachings and years of sadhana, you know, and he would complain to his teacher, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. And then suddenly one day, someone got angry with him over something and slapped him on the face with, it, with a shoe. Yeah. The light bulb went off. I just don't think it's predominantly through explanation. Yeah. I think that, you know, as Swami says, you know, studying scripture, sutras, teachings, those are all important to study because it gives you an opportunity for self-inquiry. Um, if you bring it back to yourself rather than keeping it out there as, a, as knowledge. I'm so happy, by the way, that you didn't know what I was going to be asking you when I began this interview. I probably ended up throwing you a curveball. I love all the stories you have, but I wanted to get to this in its own way first, because I believe Which it's I think important. Is much more important. <laughs> yeah. People are very enamored of hearing people's stories, and I understand that. However, the stories have a purpose in someone's life. And ultimately that purpose is to know the truth, to know themselves. So I always try to glean out of those stories, that message. That's one way that I, I'll weave it in. Swami came in a pet and took me to a past life in 1974. Then you have to ask yourself, who am I? Yes. Am I? Am I this one? Am I this one in this life? Am I that one in that life? So you see it that question resurfaces um, through these various experiences, at least for me. I want to ask you about something. It's not meant to put you on the spot. You may not want to answer it, but I'd like to ask the question anyway. One of the greatest privileges Baba has um, given me or brought to me is to interview people who are thought to be awakened. These include a tiny handful of Baba devotees and mostly other people who aren't familiar with Sri Sakya Sai Baba. They don't ask to talk about this. They don't go around talking about it to others. They would never use the words awakened or self-enlightened. Uh, but, you know, again, you can ferret these things out by talking to other people. I think of you that way. Have you had that or uh, some semblance of an awakening experience yourself? Well, I had a, an experience in 1979 uh, on my first trip that was very remarkable and totally unlike anything I had ever experienced before, <clears throat> uh, where I felt I, there was the witness there. So this is the witness interpreting this experience. Gotcha. A complete state of divine love where there was no separation from anything, that everything was God. That was it, everything, that's it. I felt I knew at that in that moment, everything there was to know. That's to almost do. exactly how I hear it described by others. Yeah, so it wasn't knowledge. However, I had a lot of vasanas that obscured that after I had that. You know, it's like, uh, who's the Buddhist teacher, the Western Buddhist teacher who said, who wrote the book, After Enlightenment, The Laundry. I, I was saying that if we have to put words to a so-called experience, then I would rather describe what occurred than give it a name and then attribute certainly not anything like enlightenment because there's, it's not like something was attained. It's like things were stripped away. In that moment, illusion was stripped away. 
and that's why I use the word awakening instead of that because I think it's more instructive, and 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 that's why I ask you the question because yeah, a little bit different from what you just said. I do personally profit from people's stories who feel they've had that an experience, and this leads me to ask. Can you share with us what prompted that experience in you? Well, yes, it's wonderful. Of course, it's a wonderful story. So it was my first trip. And like 95% uh, of everybody's first trip, I was quite physically miserable and emotionally tormented. Um, I'm wondering who he really was and what my relationship would be with him. Uh, I knew there would be one, but, um, and I had some comparisons. My mother had a relationship with Swami, my sister, Michelle, and uh, had her relationship with Swami. And I knew that mine had to be unique, very different, and not the same, not duplicate theirs. These were just little thoughts, you might say, that were in my head on, go, you know, in, in, during that first trip. So, we had been there, uh, we were a few days in Bangalore when we first arrived, it was very crowded. There were summer, summer courses going on. Um, my couple of glimpses of Swami were mesmerizing. That's the only word I can put on it. Um, and then we went to uh, Prashanti Nilayam, which of course in 1979 was still very, uh, Rustic. <laughs> yeah. rustic, very rustic and very difficult. And um, uh, he wasn't particularly giving us any attention. And of course I had came with all these stories of the attention that my sister had had and my brother-in-law had had and mostly them. And, and my sister was there in the late sixties, be well before you. Yes, my sister was there in like 69, 70, 71, living on the ashram and lived on the ashram. And I was, a we both heard about Baba at the same time. We were in my mother's house and a friend of hers from high school who I knew, but was Michelle's friend, um, had been, of course, this was a hippie, hippie time. This was the sixties, late sixties. And she had been traveling around the world. And so she made a date to tell my, my sister, Michelle, about her trip. And I was married with a very young family and uh, living in Winnipeg at the time, but I was in New York on a visit to my, I was staying at my mother's house and my sister was still living there. And so this friend walked in, literally walked in, when Michelle and I were sitting in the living room and this friend walked in and she threw her hands in the air and said, I have seen God. <laughs> So, you know, how you how do you make any meaning of that? And what, you know, I mean, I was like shocked. What is what is this? What is this? And um, as it goes, Michelle was interested. Michelle was intrigued and wound up going to these meetings in New York City with Hilda. Um, and within the year, Michelle went to see Sai Baba. And I went back to Winnipeg. I was living in Winnipeg, raising my family with zero interest in anything to do with Sachi Sai Baba or India. You probably had no time to have any interest. You know, it, it was not just time. I had had some experiences uh, in my 20s that uh, turned me off of spirituality, I would say, that frightened me, actually. I had some experiences that frightened me. And so I didn't want... I just thought this is this is this is not correct. In other words, this this kind of talk, this kind of interest, um, is not well, certainly not for me. And so uh, it wasn't until I went till my marriage started really declining, and we moved we moved back to New York, and Michelle came back from India after being there for three years that um, I saw that a change in her when she came back. And I wasn't so interested in the stories, the, these miraculous stories and all the things that he could do. He was omniscient, he was omnipresent, uh, omnipotent. I was, what struck me was the change in her. 
-hmm. And I would say it wasn't the change in her personality. I didn't, the word character wasn't in my vocabulary at the time. Mm -hmm. However, I can easily see that it was the change in her character, Mm -hmm. which is nothing more than the application of human values. Another one of his biggest points. And that's, that's what impressed me, but I couldn't put it in words. I only know that she had found something and it was had nothing to do with truth with a capital T. It had to do with Dharma with a capital D, how to live your life. How to live your life. As a kind person, as a good person, as an honest person with integrity and character. And even she would not have been able to tell you, explain it that way at the time. But I saw this in her and that intrigued me. That was the first attraction. Second attraction is that my mother had gone to India to see my sister and bring her, get her, you know, take her to the Taj Mahal and get her a bath in a fancy hotel. And the minute my mother walked on the ashram, divine light came from Swami, her first darshan, divine light came from Swami. And she also said, there, there is God. And she had no desire to leave the ashram for a minute the entire time she had gone to visit Michelle. <laughs> Who so, would have guessed this prominent Jewish family with three women <laughs> becoming ardent followers of Sai Baba? Well, and it, that was the age of exploration, I would say, anyway. However, my mother wasn't an explorer. She wasn't a hippie. She wasn't a exactly. seeker or anything. Yeah. So that really impressed me. She did not go with any intent Mm -hmm. to discover anything about God or truth. To get back to the question that you asked was, how did this, that's just the background for when I went to India and I'm sitting on the darshan line. We've been there a little over a week, not getting any attention. Everybody is frustrated, including my sister and Richard, and they've come with their three-month-old or four-month-old daughter who wasn't yet named, hoping that Swami would name her. And um, I came with my, I took my two children, and that had been at Swami's request, specifically to my mother on one of her visits. He said to her, your oldest daughter is thinking all the time, should she come to India? Should she come to India? Tell her to come and bring her two children. Off we went. (laughs) And they were quite miserable in their own way as well. Um, Everybody was really very stressed at that point in time. And we're sitting on the Darshan line. In those days, it was only three or four rows. So you were very, very close to Swami. My mother had a letter she wanted to give him. She held, and then she suddenly at the last minute, after he came out from the mandir, said, you give it to him. And so I just automatically took the letter from my mother. And when he was walking by us, I held the letter up and he ignored it and walked on. So, you know, that only fuels the fire of of disappointment, frustration, and anger even more. So, but within minutes, he turned around. He didn't get maybe 10 feet. He turned around, he came back to me. He smiled and took the letter. (laughs) Now, it, it would be easy to say that it was that smile that brought on this divine experience, but it wasn't. My reaction right after he finished giving Darshan was, I mean, I'm going to call it anger. You can call it frustration, disappointment. Those are just mild forms of anger. You know, we're all plagued by anger, the six passions, anger, jealousy, greed, lust, pride, and whatever the others are, which are all part of our vasanas as well. And so I was really upset slash angry that that's all, that's all. And this is common. I've read, I've read this. Other people have had that experience when they finally show up on the ashram thinking that something is going to happen and it doesn't. And they feel like, well, I've come all this way. You know, this is ego talk, the ego talk. Anyway, I got up from the darshan. I was too angry to talk to anybody. And I started walking off behind the temple, which in those days, there was nothing there. 
there was just hills. You walked the temp behind the temple. There were no stores. There was no, there was nothing. And I started walking up. You can call it the mountain. They're more like hills. In India, they're called, you know, in mm -hmm. New York, it would be like the size of a small Catskill mountain. Right. But they call them hills. And I started, and it was all brambles and thorns. I didn't bother to get my shoes. There were stones and the heat. You know, now it's like 11 o'clock and the heat and the, I was miserable and I just started crying. And the, the, the tears were what I call primordial tears of the pain of existence. I, it was not about any one specific thing that I was crying. I was just crying from the, what I, that's what I would call it. And when I finished crying, I was practically at the top of this hill. And that those tears turned into the anger turned to tears, and then the tears turned to this divine, expansive love. Wow. This is the experience you were telling me about earlier? Yeah. This is what brought it on? This is what brought it on. Well, this is rather unbelievable and amazing. That's how it occurred. And when I was finally at the top of this hill, <clears throat> I just sat there in this divine love. And um, then at some point, I realized that I was going to have to get up and metaphorically go back down the mountain. And that's what I did. And at that by then, budgeons were still still on. And I was at the back of the mandir. And I managed to get a seat where I could, could look through him, see him through the grating of the windows then. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was it. That divine love was now just kind of a, projected onto him. He became the object now. There was no object when I initially. It was just expansive divine love. And then but I knew that he, he, was, he was now the object of that, the source of that love, the object of that, that love. Wow. More to be revealed, Dr. Ronnie Morantz. And by that, I mean, I came here completely prepared to ask you pages of questions based on the wonderful stories you've shared previously. But I really wanted to zero in first to see if you would take the bait and talk about self-inquiry, finding the answer to who am I, knowing your truest self as Baba pretty much commanded us all to do, and you did. So what I want to do is invite you back for a second interview that we can talk about those other points that you just now gave us the tip of the iceberg of interest in, if that's okay with you, is it? Sure. Oh, sure. This is this is um, this is mana for a devotee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to come across your willingness to speak to this. We'll see yeah. later down the road. It'll probably be a month or so uh, down the road, if that's okay. I love it. I'll get to those other points and you'll have a chance then to, if you choose to add to what you've already said, if you want to, about self-inquiry. Ronnie, thank you very much. This has been wonderful. Sairam, Sairam, Sairam. Sairam, Sairam, Sairam. It's been great, yes.